Welcome to The F Word, a podcast series that examines, excavates, unpicks and reframes forgiveness through the lives of others. I'm Marina Cantacasino, a journalist from London, founder of the Forgiveness Project charity, and I've built my career investigating how those who face the most complex and devastating things in life find a way through. I'll be talking fortnightly to a guest who's experienced something very difficult or traumatic in their life, but who rather than respond with hate or bitterness, has embraced what the very least considered forgiveness as a response to pain. So for this episode of the F Word podcast, I'm talking to Paul Kohler, who in 2014 was savagely attacked in his own home. At the time, he was working as an academic lawyer living in South London with his wife, Samantha, and their four daughters. I wanted to talk to Paul because I'd read about his story in the press and was particularly interested in the fact that afterwards he got to meet one of the attackers through restorative justice. So I travelled to South London, to the house where he was attacked and where he still lives, to have this conversation. I started out by thanking Paul for agreeing to talk to me. Pleased to be here, thank you. If you don't mind, I'm just going to go straight in there, because we're talking because of something that happened to you, something very brutal, and to your family. It's not what anyone should have to endure, or what anyone would expect. It was happening when you were having dinner, I think, one evening. We'd had dinner and most of my daughters were out, but my wife and I and my eldest daughter were still in the house. The eldest went upstairs uh, with her boyfriend, actually, at the top of the house. And my wife and I were playing a board game together and there was a knock at the door. I went to answer it and thought as I opened the door, it was some of my other daughters coming in drunk with their friends. They sort of piled through the door. But as they piled through the door, it was in fact four men who started beating me uh, in, in, in the hall, um, initially saying nothing, just attacking me. And then as I retreated, started shouting, where's the money, where's the money? And so they had sort of attacked me. I knew my wife happened to just have gone upstairs seconds before. So I knew my wife was up in our bedroom. I knew my eldest was at the top of the house with her boyfriend. So I instinctively sort of protected the stairs but then they beat me, beat me, knocked me down, and then two of them went upstairs and began to terrorise Sam. The crucial part of the story, I suppose, is they didn't realise my daughter was at the top of the house. She heard the commotion, her and her boyfriend sort of shut themselves in and rang 999, and the police came within eight minutes and say, save, well, saved my life, I think. Just then you called it a crucial part of the story. It sounds so deeply shocking, Can you just kind of explain what what happens to someone when four very violent young men just break into their house? Do you go into sort of overdrive? Did you think you were in some kind of horrible film? I just can't imagine what's going on in your brain. You almost stand outside of it watching what's happening. It is a strange experience. It's, It's very, very odd and somewhat out of body. And so, you know, I was knocked to the ground, two of them sat on me. At one point, they tried to take my mouth up. For some reason, taking your voice away at that point is particularly disempowering, and that sort of gave you, or gave me, a new sort of burst of strength. So I pushed them off and got up, and then was knocked down again. And then it got well, even nastier, and they started threatening me with bringing down a big heavy door on my head. And one chap twice showed me what he was going to do as he stood above me and kept saying, where's the money, where's the money? Of course, there was no money, so I couldn't tell them. And then he was about to put it down for a third time, I, I think, t- to actually make contact, just as two police officers rushed through the door. One of them jumped on him. And I remember the story because your face was photographed, covered in bruises. You looked in a terrible state. It was across the London newspaper, wasn't it? So it got a lot of press. You got a lot of attention. I just wonder what happened in those next few days and weeks as you were recovering and coming to terms with the trauma, but also fending off a lot of media attention. Well, to an extent, we used the media attention. Two were caught on the night, the two escaped. The other two were apprehended in the end. So we very much used the media attention. uh, um, And the media, you know, they like a good photo. Beyond the press, people were incredibly kind, actually. After coming out of hospital, after a few days... People would cross the road, come and say how sorry they were. The Polish community were incredibly kind. And 
you say Polish community, was that because the four men were Poles? Polish nationals. And so Polish people in this country felt a particular, not that they should, but felt a responsibility and wanted to apologise to me. I remember a Polish cleaner in the hospital coming in just to apologise. I remember a Polish woman coming up to me and asking for my forgiveness. So I, I held her hand and said it wasn't, it wasn't for her to apologise for her compatriots. And the Polish community in Poland sent me literally thousands of emails and, and the Polish government was instrumental in, in capturing one of them. The Polish government sent over two police officers to help apprehend the fourth one and working with the community. You said that the media attention was very helpful at the beginning when catching um, a couple of the offenders, but I think there was an element of the story that you didn't wholly endorse the way that they portrayed what had happened. Perhaps you could just say a bit about that, Paul. Uh, I wasn't happy with some of their approaches. The press tried to turn it into an Englishman in his castle attacked by, by immigrants, and so it was used to pump up uh, anti-immigrant, anti-EU feeling, and it's so much so that it's actually used in a EU give advertising campaign during, during the Leave campaign. Uh, so, so it, it was yes, it was misused by the press for their own purpose, or elements of the press, not all of it, of course. And I was turned into the English hero defending his home against foreign invaders. I clearly wasn't happy with that. Did you say something publicly about that? I, I, I got the Daily Mail actually. I, I wrote a piece on police cuts, informed by my attack. I got them to agree to me writing something about it there. So it was actually in the pages of the Mail, which had been a, one of the perpetrators of, of the sort of the anti-immigrant story. I also was given in the victim impact statement in court. I was allowed to speak, and at that point, I, I, I again made the point it had been misused by elements of the press. I didn't want to be too scathing because the press had also been very helpful, but I wanted to make the point the story had been misused. The media wanted to turn it into a very negative story about hate and division and insularity. But what happened? All these strangers contacting you and offering um, encouragement and support. And that's, that's where you wanted the focus to be. That's enormously reassuring and heartwarming in a way. But the trauma must have sat with you and your family. I mean, did you talk a lot about it? What about your daughters who weren't here? Bizarrely, because I was the one who was physically attacked, I saw myself getting better as I recovered and as the wounds healed. It was far harder for my wife and particularly my daughter to recover because of the mental trauma. My wife was terrorised but never attacked. She was made to lie down uh, with her face under, under a hood. My daughter barricaded in her room, room where she, where she knew for years the place of safety, was suddenly a place where she'd imagined hearing her parents being murdered, as what she thought was happening. She did move out soon afterwards because she couldn't reconcile the fear she felt when in her bedroom. Paul then went on to explain that his daughter had actually moved back home a year later but only after she'd had a restorative justice meeting with one of the attackers in prison, along with her parents. Restorative justice is where a victim gets to ask all the questions from the offender. And so like this, she was able to rehumanise the perpetrator and no longer see him as this terrifying monster. Restorative justice, by the way, reframes justice. It sees crime as an injury rather than wrongdoing, and justice as healing rather than punishment. It's a really well-researched process that has been shown to increase victim satisfaction and hold offenders accountable, even to the extent it has a real impact on reoffending rates. Paul, tell us how that happened. Had you heard of restorative justice before? And how was it introduced to you? And how safe was the actual process when it came to it? I'm embarrassed to say, as an academic lawyer, I knew absolutely nothing about restorative justice. And I was on the radio talking about the attack and saying how I'd like to know why they'd, they'd attack me. And representative of the, of the charity Why Me heard me on the radio and contacted me and said, would I like them to help facilitate a restorative justice meeting whereby it might be possible to meet one or more of the attackers? And I said, yes, I would. And so a process began that lasted, I think, more than a year 
to um, counsel us, approach the attackers, approach the prison authorities, and eventually arrange a meeting between me, my wife, and my eldest daughter, and one of the attackers. Was only one of the attackers willing to take part? This is why we, we must never see restorative justice as, as a right for victims, because sometimes the, the perpetrator won't be appropriate. One of them was thought to not to be appropriate. Two others, there was some discussion, but in the end it was only the fourth one who they decided to go ahead with. I think, is that because, when you say appropriate, it's because the attacker, the offender, has to be willing to show remorse and to acknowledge what they've done has been wrong because otherwise it can just re-traumatise victims. I think that's right and so the psychological profile of is clearly important and, and yes you need the perpetrator to participate in the process in a constructive way. Did you all three want the same thing out of it? Did you have the same questions that you wanted to ask? Similar expectations? No, we didn't. We had very different approaches and questions. You know, I went in wanting to know why they'd attacked me. That's why the charity is called Why Me that, that was facilitating it. So I went in wanting to know why they'd done it and why they'd chosen me. My wife, on the other hand, wanted to go in and tell them what she, how she felt. She wanted them to hear from her, from her perspective how awful it was. And my daughter, we always thought naively, went in simply wanted to find out how they were going to change their, their lives and how he was going to, to, to mend his ways. And we were rather patronising about that and thought how young and how naive and, and how sweet. And in the end, during the course of probably almost a two-hour meeting with, with the perpetrator, it emerged that only my daughter's question was actually an important one because I was never going to find out why they'd chosen me because given that it was some sort of gangland attack. There'd been reasons they, I suspect, got the wrong house, but they weren't going to divulge details because presumably there were others on the outside who were involved. So I heard nothing, really, about why it was me. Uh, with my, my, my wife did tell them, or tell him how she felt, and he said, actually, he knew already, he knew from her reaction during the attack, he knew exactly how she felt. And bizarrely, therefore, returning to my, my daughter's question, because he apologised, we then began to, began to interrogate whether the apology was genuine or superficial, and therefore what he was going to do with the rest of his life became crucially important to judging his bona fides, to, to see whether or not he meant what he was saying. And so the conversation focused almost entirely on how he was going to change his ways. And, and what did he say about changing his ways? What was he going to do? He's clearly had you know, a tough life, clearly intelligent. He had clearly got into, fallen into bad ways with, with drugs and violence and crime. Um, and he made the point, you know, I'm not, not going to make just superficial promises. This is what I'm trying to do. He was, he'd taken English lessons to improve his English for our meeting. He had a child in this country who he was feared he wasn't going to see again because because his partner had broken up contact. So he was learning how to write in English as well. He was taking classes at the prison. So he was you know, he was trying to mend his ways. Whether within our prison system there's enough to actually get him to where he needs to get, I'm not sure. But he was making an effort. And the honesty of the fact it wasn't just a bland promise but gave some credence to what he was saying. And how did the meeting with him affect the three of you? Was it very helpful in the way that it so often can be with a victim who feels empowered and more at peace with themselves? With that, with my daughter, I was hugely helped by it. It demythologised the attacker and meant that she soon came back to live in the house. She was no longer feared as she had been. And it's typical to say one was traumatised, but I, I never had a huge amount of trauma. Just the healing process had helped me. And then Paul told me something he did which I found really fascinating. And he said this was totally instinctive on his part. He came back home after the attack, after about four or five days in hospital, 
And one of the first things he did was to lay down in each of the positions where he'd been attacked so that he could recapture the vista from a place of safety, a vista which didn't have one or more of the attackers looming over him. And that, he said, was an important part of reclaiming his space and recapturing his home. After the attack, I walked in and suddenly realised I wanted to do it. Uh, had anyone been watching, it was sort of somewhat bizarre, because all of it was very clear and graphic in my mind, so I knew exactly where I'd been. Uh, and it helped hugely. What about your feelings towards the attackers? Were you full of anger and fury? Well, was there any hate? Um, I don't think hate, no, I'm not sure if there was hate. There was obviously anger, but more anger in a on behalf of my family thing. It was, as I think most parents would, would recognise, it, it's the thought of your family being sub subjected to this, or the fear, or, or the violation. So it was anger almost on behalf of my family. Uh, obviously, I, there, there was a degree of anger about the fact I'd been attacked. Um, I didn't say one thing I should say about my wife's, we must be anchored about this, my wife did not like the process. So I, I don't want people to think restorative justice always works for everyone. My wife felt annoyed with herself after the process because she felt she'd been too forgiving of him mm. and she didn't want to be and it took her a long while to reconcile the fact that she'd ended up being nicer than she wanted to be to him. This really reminded me of something a couple of academics in America told me a few years ago, Dr Mark Umbright and Dr Marilyn Armour, who've both done loads of research into restorative justice. And they were talking about the paradox of forgiveness in restorative justice. Namely, that it appears the more you talk about forgiveness in a restorative justice setting, the less safe people will feel. On the other hand, the more you create the right climate and conditions, the more likely it is that forgiveness will happen. And my takeaway from this is that forgiveness should never be an objective of restorative justice, but it may well be an outcome. And all decent organisations working in this field, like Why Me, the charity that approached Paul, will make this abundantly clear. The charity stressed all the way through, you don't have to forgive, that's not part of the process. Um, clearly the fact that me and my daughter had taken that approach might have influenced Sam. But I think it's more, I think it's probably just Sam's character in that social setting. She felt the need to be polite to him and she felt in, in, in retrospect she shouldn't have been. And with yourself, do you find it difficult to say the word forgiveness? And what does it mean to you? And was it actually forgiveness? My wife always tells me I'm too forgiving of people. Um, I'm not sure I'm always calm, but uh, my anger soon dissipates. I'm not someone who bears a grudge, but we're all different. That's just my character. Clearly that, that, that informs your approach to life, but it's not something you really control. It's now several years since the attack. Do you think about it still? Does the family still talk about it? Has it affected the family dynamics in any way? Um, do we, talk, we don't talk about it often. I suppose on the anniversary we always mention it and have a drink and think about it for a moment. But it, yeah, it's changed my life dramatically. It, um, this is where, whilst we should regret bad things, we shouldn't assume bad things therefore have no good consequences. So it politicised me. It made me fight to save Wimbledon Police Station. It got me into politics. Um, so it changed my life dramatically. You know, I'm now a councillor. I stood for Parliament. None of that would have happened had it not been for the attack. So yes, it was an awful moment. But in fact, a huge amount of good came from it. I have a political friend who's been a politician for 30 years. He turned to me ironically and said, my God, it's a gift that keeps on giving, by which he meant... You know, it's suddenly given me a platform that I didn't have before. And I think that's an important thing to learn. So I'm interested, because I've talked to, you know, many victims of trauma and crime and violence, because I'm looking for healing narratives, you might say, and redemptive narratives, that is a common thing. Finding the gift in the wound and meaning-making. That is just a common thing that goes through every single story, and I find it really fascinating. Lots of religious people came up to me and said to me a number of times, 
how religious they thought I was, I'd forgiven. And I always bristled at that. I am sort of religious, but not strongly religious. But there was a brilliant article shown me later in the Christian Monitor where a prelate writing about my incident made the point forgiveness is not a Christian value or a religious value. He made the point it was a human value. It's very much of the human condition to forgive rather than something sort of imposed by, by religious structures. And I thought that was very interesting and very true. So if I was to ask you your definition, because it is interesting that it's a word that no one really agrees on and everyone has their own thoughts about it and it does cut public opinion down the middle, really. There are those who are very fronted by the very notion of it. But if I was to ask you what is your definition of forgiveness, would you be able to give me one? Forgiveness is all about you reconciling yourself with what's happened. Forgiving the perpetrator is really dealing with your internal issues and ensuring you're no longer embittered by it. So forgiveness, bizarrely, paradoxically, almost comes like a selfish act whereby you reconcile yourself with the trauma. Consequence of that is, of course, you forgive them, but it's a need internally. I think that's right. I mean, I don't know if you heard of Eva Kaur, who was a survivor of the Holocaust, Auschwitz. And she always said, I forgive not because they, the Nazis, deserve it, but because I deserve oh, it. Yeah. And she actually used to call it a magic medicine that had really saved her life. That's exactly the point I was trying to make. Thank you for listening to the F Word podcast. To dig a bit deeper around some of the themes we've talked about, do check out the show notes by going to theforgivenessproject.com slash podcast. And from there, you can also explore the Forgiveness Project website, which over the years has collected and shared many more stories of how people have transformed the darkest of situations. I also want to invite you to join the F Word Podcast Facebook group, especially if you have more to discuss or share. Again, to find the link, go to theforgivenessproject.com slash F Word Podcast. And finally, all these podcasts have grown out of years of trying to shift the narrative of our time away from one of hate and division towards empathy and understanding. So if you've enjoyed this podcast, please do consider donating even just the smallest amount to help us continue our work. All details of how to do this, again, are on the show notes page of our website. But most of all, I hope you'll join me again. Next time, I'll be talking to Kia Shear, quite a remarkable woman who somehow is able to talk about forgiveness in the context of the 2008 Mumbai terrorist attacks that claimed 164 lives, including those of her husband, Alan, and their 13-year-old daughter, Naomi. <laughs>